can, can I just start for, you know, as a writer, just asking you about the first paragraph of your book? And I hope you'll forgive me if I read it out loud. It's short. He speaks in your voice. This is this is Angel. He speaks in your voice, Dublin. And there's something hopeful in the new edges of his words and phrases that has come through revolutions, generations and across continents to be witnessed here on these streets now. I think that's a beautiful opening paragraph. And what I wonder at first, if you could tell us, did that come as, as the beginning? Did you labour over it? It seems effortless. It seems absolutely beautiful way of starting the book. Yeah, thanks, Colm. Uh, great to be speaking with you to start with, all the way from New York. It's so cool. Um, yeah, that came first. That was literally the first line in the piece. Um, uh, I would have written it maybe six, seven years ago in uh, in school. Um, during a leaving cert exam, I was I was uh, supervising a, a kind of a, I was a reader in one room for one student, and the student left. And uh, I remember just writing that line. I'd obviously been reading a bit of Don DeLillo at the time. Uh, I literally take the first line from, he speaks from In Your Voice American. So from Don DeLillo's Underworld, it was the same kind of thing. And it's just the same kind of epic response. But uh, yeah, that, that that was there from the start. But you know yourself, it was worked on so much. Even a year ago, I was submitting to see if a piece of the book would be um, put into a literary magazine, you know, a, a little excerpt. And I remember emailing the editor and asking him about um, the first line, whether we put in uh, have or has, and where do we put the stress? Is it on hope or is it on the language? And we settled on hope was where we stressed. So I'm glad we, we settled on, on, on that. And the second thing I want to ask you is about, about Brigham itself, about the idea of its history. And there's several mentions to, uh, of a monument, of a, of a massacre, of something that had happened in history that it doesn't deeply affect the characters, but it's just there in the background. It's like a code. It's like a, it's like a, a sound you pay special attention to. The idea, the idea that this is not, this, while this book is very much a book of the present, it's alert to what happened more than 100 years ago. Yeah, history is, especially in Bob Regan, history is always present. You can't get away from it. It's like the sack of Balbriggan is what the town is famous for. And then even the name Balbriggan, Balbriggan's the trousers. So as a as a town and as a, a word in itself, Balbriggan, it's 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 steeped in history. But I think the the point I was trying to make was that's old history. And I think the line from Princess in the middle of the book is that what they're living through is 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 to become history. They are the new a topic of history that we'll be looking back in 50 years time and saying, you know, they were creating history. And especially coming out of the back of COVID times, it felt as if we were living in a, a definite historical epoch or a new kind of time. I think Princess was the one who, with a true our history project, was able to grasp that. So, uh, yeah, history is here. It's in Balbriggan. and it's literally on the streets. And you can't miss it when you walk down Main Street. They have the, the big mural to, to a stabbing, you know, to uh, black and tans and to colonialism and imperialism. It's there, it's present, it's always on the streets. And I thought that was a, an interesting way to juxtapose that with the idea of violence in the year 2020, the 21st century, I suppose. Talking about history, and I'm thinking that in 100 years time, if a historian wanted to look at a place where you could see the change in Ireland, you, you, you could see a new Ireland coming into being, that Balbriggan would, would be, instead of being the sacking of Balbriggan 100 years ago, in 100 years' time, the Balbriggan of now would seem like, like a cauldron, I, I suppose, in which a new Ireland came into being, which was effectively multicultural. Yes, um, I think the, the way I looked on it, and I've said it in many talks and interviews and the rest is, ultimately... Balbriggan is Ireland's future now. Um, and, and a number of things have kind of come together to make that happen. And there's another a lot of pressures on the town as a result of that, because people aren't, you know yourself, from all, all sides of the political persuasion. And I was conscious of this when I was writing the book, and I wanted to make sure that I got the details right and try and show the town as it was and how the people living in the town as they were without judgment and uh, being impartial to to what's going on. But as I was saying as well, I had a I was privileged position that I'm in in the town, in the school that I'm in, and the classrooms that I'm in, that they have, as I said, 50% second generation immigrants would be in front of me in the classroom. So this this way of living and this this way of interacting and this way of uh, solidarity, the way 
the students get on, the way we get on, um, had to be written about and had to be discussed and had to be dug down into and see how what you uncover and and what stories you can tell from that. Um, and that's why, to me, the details in the town and rendering the town as it is right now, like you said, felt very important because you are documenting, I think, genuinely think the birth of something um, and the beginning of something. I think your novel Youth is important as a document that documents this, but it's also, of course, a novel and it's also filled with characters. And, and what you're doing is you're, in a way, creating people who, who rise above their mere historical moment or their race or, you know, what it is they're doing within a multicultural Ireland to become themselves and that, and that this is the great project. But, but in order to do that, you have to create a sort of low-grade racism. Um, that is just there all the time, throbbing in the background, that arises at a certain moment when, um, for example, Barry has all sorts of views, um, the government and refugees and how Balbriggan, there's a lovely line, Balbriggan needs to be given back to Balbriggan people. And he talks about Balbriggan shops for Balbriggan people. Obviously, that's one extreme. It really only happens once at this moment in the book. But there's a, there's a really wonderful moment where a woman goes into a chemist shop and she sees two people who are not white and she presumes they have to be mother and daughter. And it, she, she doesn't mean any harm, but it's a lovely little moment where you just see people's inability to make distinctions and how offensive something can be that isn't meant to be there. But these are very small things against a much larger picture, which is of not only people struggling, but people becoming themselves in, in a way that happens in all novels, where you watch someone confronting their destiny uh, with, with a certain set of characteristics up against hurdles and um, using choices, using chances. And, and the, what you're doing is you're rescuing these characters from being merely statistics or being merely figures in a, in a sort of document that shows how Ireland is changing. These characters rise above that. I think it's an important element in, in your work as an artist. Yeah, um, there's a number of things at play there. And I think you live and die by the characters, but also how well drawn they are. So it's easy to throw out a character like Tanya and Dean and Angel and Princess. But unless you have, you render them and you create them in such a way that they're believable, they, they, they lie flat on the page. So small things such as the incident in The Chemist and, and Barry and the rest, you, I have to be aware of them and see them in in the character's view. Like, so for Princess, for example, um, if I didn't have those details and we didn't have that sense of who she was and what she had to deal with and low level stuff like that, um, the character wouldn't be able to breed on the page and it wouldn't be a real character. If that makes it sounds ridiculous, but it, it, the character wouldn't be believable. Um, so that's what I was all constantly kind of struggling with and making sure that it was right on the page and the, the character was able to. Um, yeah, be believable, um, if, if that makes any sense to you at all. And I think I think the way you work with this is that, that you use your ear as much as your eyes that, you know, when, when the first time I've, I come across the feds, I realise, oh, that's what they must call the cops, the feds. And I love it. I love every time it comes up and I love realising what it is. I love allow. Could you, could you just take us through allow? Uh, because I've started to say allow now. Yeah. And um, <laughs> if you could advise me as to how to use allow. Yeah. I don't know. I'm just a, <laughs> it just I'm a cipher. It just comes through me. But no, uh, the language like that um, is yeah. That, that that took a while. It's you, you can't just like the, the story I tell people. I'll tell you as well is that I was um, I had a class about six years ago and it was a communications English and communications class. So we just took a dictionary of of language slang language and we put up on the board and I'd gather it up over the over the weeks. So there are words like that, but then you have to see them in action and you have to, like you say, get the rhythm of them and where they're used. I, I've seen people just take certain words and plant them into onto a line and they just sound ridiculous. So it's it's not, not enough having the word itself. You have to have the rhythm of the sentence and how the word is actually spoken. So the likes of allow is, like, I presume it's just an exasperation, you know, it's like, oh, come on, allow. Yeah. Or, yeah, oh, come on. I think it's just come on. Or, or, or I'd hear Janie Mac. You know, you've heard that from... Um, yes. Even the words like feds, like you have a choice to make, as, as I'm sure you know, especially for any vernacular kind of um, writing. And James Kelman would have been my kind of totem pole for that. Um, Who would be? James Kelman. Yeah. James Kelman, a, a huge yeah. fan of his. But you make a decision on the vernacular to 
they just let it live on the page. And like you said, hopefully then people will just go with it. And if you once you go with it, it's part of the journey. I'm sure you've seen it from the opening third person to the first person to the really closed off third person at the end. My intention was always that you feel distance from these people and the language should distance you. But then over time, as you get closer to the language, you get closer to the person and you get closer to the characters. And so it was my intention, I'm glad to hear that you're doing it, that the language becomes normalized for you as, you, as you're reading the character like Angel and you're, you understand him what he's saying. And as you understand what he's saying, you start to understand him. Um, you're on yeah, I, I mean, I didn't have any trouble understanding it so it became normalized in that sense, but it wasn't normalized in the sense that I found it exciting and energetic, that it, that it, that it, that it gave me, that, that it created a sort of, I suppose, a, a, a sort of um, fizz on the page that that you were hearing a new a, a new sound, and I think you're right that that really did happen in Scotland, didn't it? That that generation of novelists from Alistair Gray to James Kellman to um, Irving Welsh and um, to Janet Galloway, they set about finding a vernacular, and then making that vernacular literary and putting it into the novel as though it were normal. This is what language is here, and 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 it isn't received English. It is instead an English that has a funny energy and, and that when you when you see it on the page, it, it sort of lives for you. It's, it's what W.B. Yeats, when he was talking about Del, John Linton Singh, called a living speech. And um, I'm reminded of Singh because the idea that in Ireland, um, 125 years ago, this figure, John Millington Singh, arrived on the Aran Islands. And what he found what was a sort of energy that wasn't on what he calls the mainland. He calls it a primitive energy. But what he does with it is he writes his book, The Iron Islands, but then he gives it to the playboy of the Western world. He has these wonderful women coming in, you know, openly sexual in, in a country that didn't, didn't seem to allow that, filled with, 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 with um, I suppose, flavor, texture in their speech, and all of the time willing to have a fresh response to life. If a man came in who murdered his father in the Playboy of the Western world, instead of condemning him or calling the police, they just would wonder, well, what was that like? And so I'm finding the same sort of excitement here where, where there's something new happening. And it isn't about race. It's about language. It's yeah. about a, a new way of picking up words, of, of, of allowing dialogue to happen. And that the dialogue itself then gives the novel a sort of excitement. And I just wonder if, um, I mean, it's, it's slightly close to Roddy Doyle in the sense of when, when, when we read those novels first, realizing he came out, he, he was a teacher. In other words, he, he came in as a sort of semi-authority figure into the room and was able to, was able to listen and get a real sense of um, what was behind the words. And I wonder if your job as a teacher helps you in that. Yeah, there's a few things to say there. It's funny you should say Singh, because I'd always have the, the idea of, remember Singh, he wrote in his diaries that he'd be above the pub on the Aran Islands and he'd be looking through a crack and he'd be listening to what they're saying and getting the stories from them there. I wasn't quite looking at through a crack. It, it's, it's in front of me. And um, and like Roddy Doyle as well, you like you, you have to be, you have to, like I'm a teacher first, I say this, I'm a teacher first, I'm a writer second, but you have to be smart for what you're doing. I don't have time to go off and research massive novels and, do do novels that would take a lot of research basically because I'm working nine to five. So when I go home, I decided to use what was in front of me, like you're saying, and listen to the language in front of me and study the language that I was hearing in front of me and stu also study the people in front of me and use that as a kind of um, a starting point for a novel. You know, um, I remember Rob Doyle, who's a writer who I admire, he says like the one thing he gets when he is not working full time is the chance to read and to think about things. And w when he's reading, he's able to, you know, work work into his into his work. So for me, I don't get a chance to read as often as I'd like, and I wouldn't get a chance to research. So I use what was in front of me as research. Um, I'm lucky enough then to be able to hear the students around me. And it's unfortunately now, it's getting to the point with this book, uh, I still stop the kids now. And it's like, so what was that you said? But now they're smart to it. They say, oh, you're only asking me this question because you want to put it in the next book. Um, I, was, I was undercover for the first, you know, the last <laughs> six years. Um, but now they're, they're getting smart. But I'm still listening. And I think for myself, I don't know whether it's to keep me interested in the teaching or whether I genuinely have an interest. I, I can't work it out, but I'm interested in language. And when you're hearing these words around you and you hear the sentences being spoken and you're hearing um, the mix of, 
language being put together in front of your ears and eyes, I, I kind of, I, I was drawn to it and I had to put it on the page. And I'm glad yeah. you used it, the dialogue. I, I mean, there are really, there are really wonderful examples. Um, on page 176, for example, um, he's talking to Princess and um, he says, allow Princess, please. You know, I'm sorry. Don't be extra. Don't be extra. So great. Um, swear down. I said, sorry, yeah. And I mean, you could an actor. I'm 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 saying it deliberately badly, you know. But an actor could have such a good time with with how each word is inflected. But what I'm saying is, as the reader, who the whole idea of don't be extra is completely new to me. But I found it totally exciting and interesting that don't be extra. And uh, so so that that idea of a sort of new language coming into being as a sort of new sort of town comes into being, as then a new sort of literature is needed to reflect that. Yeah. Um... Yeah, the, the lines like that uh, where you, you hear them, like even don't be extra, like you reading it there is hilarious. Like I know I could never read it. And that's one thing when you're writing this, it's like it would just sound ridiculous for me to ever read it in a reading. So I'd always read the opening when I do it. Um, but that's that's the kind of the price you have to pay when you're, you're you're taking other people's words and you're putting them on a page in, in that kind of regard. Um, don't be extras one, uh, don't be, uh, this is long, uh, don't give me a headache. You know, it's just, it's, it's, the list is just nonstop that you have to kind of stop and ask yourself, does it sound right on the page? But I was lucky enough that I had um, a audio book done as well. And there was an actor, Gabriel Adewusi, who did Angel, and he was able to, he's a brilliant actor. Um, he, like you said, brought an energy to it as well. And he was able to translate it onto the, onto the audio book, which, which really helped me. And um, there's something in the novel that I, that I haven't really read before, and I um, is there's there's a, there's a lot of bad sex in the book, but for, forget that. I mean, I mean, there has to be bad sex. These, these are young people; they're trying things out. They're all gathered together. If a parent is away, they all gather in the house, and you know, there's a lot of drinking and there's a lot of back and forth between boys and girls. And um, what I was interested in were, I suppose, the idea of how tentative it still is for them, how nervous the boys are, especially. But the girls too, but the boys more than the girls over what they should do next, how they should handle this. It isn't, it isn't as though watching pornography as they do, gathering together as they do, with all these new freedoms, the boys are still so, so afraid, so wondering, was this the right moment? What should they do now? And I thought that was incredibly well handled. And in a way, it's, it's outside, you know, the ideas of whether this is a new town, Balbregan, or where it is. Just this idea of anyone who's ever been 15 reading this knows, I think this is a brilliant account of what that tentative business with boys and sex is like. And um, I mean, I'm not asking you, is this, is this autobiographical? I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm talking about this as a literary thing, as, as bringing in this idea that these, are, these may seem super confident in some ways, really not confident in others, but in the middle somewhere, the sex thing is very dramatic. Yeah, I think uh, th that came out more so when Dean... Um... But if but all the all the lad characters, I suppose, is is the case. Um, yeah, it was just it's something you see like, with teenagers, especially. I was once a teenager myself <laughs> and a young boy, so uh, I'd have I'd have knowledge again there as well. But for contemporary boys, you can't get away from the you can't get away from porn and um, what's their expectations in porn and the bravado that, that all that brings. And they're all they're swimming in it, they're, they're swamped by it. It's, it's, you, you can't get away from it. Even as a, a teacher of 14 years, you've just seen it and the idea of it and the uh, ubiquitous nature of it, just, it's everywhere. And so- Yeah, you're not, I mean, I mean, this, for example, with Dean, um, I, I mean, he's, he's getting close to, to being with this girl in a serious sort of way. And he says, I, uh, this feels good. I can only groan in reply. I'm freaking out under the weight of everything. I'm scared from all the porn I've watched. I know a fair bit about horny women. And you go, no, you don't. Like, stop now thinking. But you realize, of course, that he is he is treating what he's been seeing in porn as very serious indeed, as informative, as almost formative. Yeah. And he's trying to deal with his own body, his own feelings versus what he thinks is what's real, which is the porn and what he's feeling somehow isn't so real. That's like that. That is internet brain unfiltered. It's that generation where they they can't tell the difference between, as you say, what is real and what is not real. Like everything they put up on online, they know isn't real, but yet everything they see back to them, they can they consider is real. So you, how do you filter out then the porn, and then what your friend is posting? That's just a happy birthday, I suppose. You know, um, party. Everything is is mixing and merging, and it's something that I suppose my generation and our generation haven't lived through. So we don't know how 
how would it affect people in their everyday lives? Um, like I've seen it from my side where teenagers put stuff out online and they're surprised when there's an actual physical or a real life uh, repercussions from it. Because to them, they've posted it, it's out there. It's, it's, not, it's not real. But then when you talk about the filter and you talk about porn coming this way, they, they buy it as real. So it's just such a mixed up idea, I think, the internet. And to grow up with the internet is not something I've done. So I just tried to tap into that and the expectations of how to live with this internet and with this constant stream. And especially for, for young men and girls from such a young age to be dealing with the idea of porn and the access, accessibility of it. And then, of course, Tanya has to deal with the, the real life consequences of of actions that become considered porn as well. So it's there. And if you were to write teenagers, and forget about Bob Regan, but if you are to write teenagers now in the year 2022, 2023, you have to address phone usage, which I don't know whether it works or not on the page. I hope it does. But you also have to address the elephant in the room, which is online world and things that they see constantly from an online perspective, which is hard to transcribe onto the page. And that's where we come to Tanya and the idea of Tanya and how Tanya looks on the page was a kind of a new way to tap into that experience and how to express her internet brain through that page, if you know what, I'm, what I mean there. Yeah, I think the Tanya scene is, is, I think is really very dramatic. I, I found the phone usage um, where one of the boys, it must be Dean, um, feels that what's happening to him sexually, which, I mean, he, he is about to have sex, it seems to me, and he should be delighted with himself. Uh, you know, in any other novel, he'd be all ready for this. But what's fascinating about your book is the way the, just you're in his mind and you have the porn on one side, but you have the other side, you have his phone. And he's not sure that this is going to be entirely real unless he records it. And it was something I'd never thought of. It. It's the most dramatic idea that somehow he is caught between two things. His own fe feeling that he has an idealized sex, which is porn his own feeling that it won't be real unless it's recorded. In the middle, of course, is a thing called him. And as the reader, you're completely um, caught between these three forces, the him, the, the porn, and the idea, I, which I'd never thought about, exactly. that he would have, that, that he reaches for his phone to see where it is. Yeah, that, uh, that, that, that comes from just conversations with kids about, not about things like that, but in general, like to be lads that be telling me that they, that they saw someone get a, a slap or a punch and they got it on their camera. And I'd be like, how did you manage to get your phone out and record it? And their line is, well, the phone is always in my hand and the camera is always on. So it's not like me, an old person, I'm like, oh, yeah. there's something happening, I better record this on my phone. It's, it's an extension of their hand. It's part of their experience of walking yeah. down the street the phone and, and is in th the this is captured very beautifully in a moment where she's having an argument with her mother and someone in the supermarket's already got the phone to, to film the, that tiny little thing in case anything anything dramatic occurs it's going to be it's, it's going to be filmed um, and yeah. can I ask you um, um, you know um, William Faulkner has a novel called As I Lay Dying do you know that book? of course yeah, yeah. And you, can you just ta take us through that book? Yeah, uh, As I Lay Dying would have been one of the main uh, books for me. I would have read it a few times when I was writing uh, Youth. Um, it's a book from uh, a family and uh, different perspectives like Youth, but to be more characters in it. Um, one of the main things for me for As I Lay Dying was, it's obviously in the vernacular, but um, um, Faulkner in a Paris Review interview says that Darl is one of the main characters and he used Darl's language to... That was his way to write. So everyone else was very vernacular heavy in As I Lie Down, as you know. But he said Daryl was the one person that he could kind of hang a lot of the yeah. um, writerly so the, the story. This, 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 this is a big family and they're moving across the southern states of America in some way or other with the body of their mother in a sort of coffin. And they're wandering along, but that's not what's important, really. What's important is that each of them gets to speak yeah. and they get it. And sometimes it just could be a line. And as you say, it's, it's, it has a, it's filled with local flavor and Southern speech. And the next one then gets his or her name at the top of the page. And then you get them speaking. And so you never know what's going to happen when you turn the page. But, but, it, is, but it is a sense, it's not necessarily a chorus as much as, because they don't speak together. 
but it is it is as though each each perspective comes in to give you a, a different version. No, it, no, it just struck me. I think that book for every novelist, and indeed for every reader, maybe it, it has a special place. It's called As I Lay Dying by William Faulkner, and it just struck me reading this book. Hey, hey, this guy has to have read As I Lay Dying. And even there's, yes, you'll know, there's one part at the end, I forget the girl's name, she goes into a chemist or a pharmacist and she wants to get a a, a tablet for, a, a, you know, a, I think a kind of an abortion. Um, this was a kind of formative for, for the possibilities of what a novel, a multi-voice novel can do. And she goes in and she meets the guys and um, they bring her around the back to, we won't get into it, but they give her a tablet and she walks away and she's delighted with herself. But then in the next chapter, we get the perspective of the chemist or the lad working the chemist. And he tells us that he gave her a paracetamol. Um, reading that for me, I remember back in, it would have been my early 20s, it just blown my mind of how you can do that with multi-voiced uh, novel, that you can kind of set something up and then just explode the reader's mind in the next chapter. Um, and it obviously... Yeah, there are, time, there, there are times where you tell the same story from two perspectives. And what's interesting is you don't do that all the time. So that it's just something that you use when you need it. Is that right? Yes, yeah. Uh, definitely it was done... Like, as you're getting towards the, the thin end of the wedge, as you're coming towards the end of the book, it was important that was done. And in the major scenes, like there's a scene where we're on Main Street and Angel and uh, Plumie and Paddy have an argument about the word all right hour. And I thought that was a, a kind of, you know, a scene that you kind of, a major turning point in the book. So you wanted a few perspectives. And then the end part as well, you wanted a few different perspectives just to kind of, you're trying to pull all the strands together for the reader. And you want the reader then to, because by the end of the novel, the reader should know all the characters at this stage, so they should understand where each of them are coming from and pull them from when they're talking about the same kind of scene. And there'll be a scene on the beach that's repeated, I think, repeated four times, yeah. three times, yeah. 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 And it was important then that we get the character's sense of kind of uh, an end to this kind of, the, the journey that they're making and the journey that they've been on and are going on. Um, it might have been easier, um, but it wouldn't have had the same result if you had just given these kids their lives without an um, older generation. But one of the subtleties of the book, and what I mean, you're, you're extremely tactful about, is giving them parents. Because that's the hardest thing to do, because it isn't as they're, they're not in permanent battle with their parents, nor are they deeply involved taking advice from their parents. But the parents are there, and the reader gets to imagine the things, things like love, dependence, all those things. The reader gets to imagine those, but what you get are, are single moments where a, a bit of conflict or a moment of pure connection. But it, but it, but it's jagged. It's 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 rich. It's never direct, and it's and it's not systematic, or indeed, it's not. Um, I, I suppose symmetrical. The, the parents were an important part of the book in a number of ways. There's like on two levels. Um, I wanted Angel and Princess to be on the journey, basically on their own. So I wanted them to establish them, like, to be talking about the new new Balbriggan in New Orleans. They have to deal with the world that they face, literally the Main Street of Balbriggan, on their own terms. So the parental involvement for them was, you know yourself, it was in the background. Whereas for Tanya and Dean, they have the weight of, in Dean's case, his father's a famous boxer, so he has to deal with that expectation. And Tanya, of course, has her, her father and the mother, the mother issues. But... Uh, the, the parents in all kind of teenage fiction and, and, and even in movies, um, parents shouldn't be there. You, you don't want them to, if anything, they're, you, you know, they're, they get in the way and they bog down. You want to see the characters and especially teenage characters express themselves freely. In my case, it was on the streets. So that's why I kind of kept the home out a lot. Um, but it, intentionally for Princess and um, Angel, they were kept out to just show you that these are basically people out on their own they have to deal with this world on their own and on their own terms. Um, the parents obviously have been on a different journey. And the parents know Bob Regan differently, whereas Angel and Princess are starting from scratch and they have to deal with this world in, on their own terms. Um, Tanya, Tanya um, has a particular problem, but there's a wonderful moment. I absolutely adored it. I just... Uh, if if you were if you were to show people, is there one paragraph of this book? It's very, I think there's a... Is it a girls' football movie? Match, and the father runs out on the pitch and it looks as though he's going to go for the referee. And you think, all right, I'd get that. And but he runs across the pitch and he just goes for some guy who's on the other side of the pitch and wants to hit him. And of course, you don't know why. You learn why later. But it's a wonderful moment of pure chaos, anarchy coming in from the side, which is what, you know, you think the father's going to be so loyal to his daughter, he's going to do something for her. But you realize, no, that's not how he thinks. 
And um, there's something else going on all the time. I just, sorry, just a small touch of the book. You probably, you know, I think, am I right in thinking that those sort of scenes for this book came to you quickly um, without having to put much thought into them, that they seem they seem effortless in the way they're done. They seem natural. And you seem, the, 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 I'm not saying you didn't revise the language, but I'm saying those images seem extraordinarily fresh and vivid. And I wonder if they were that for you, you know, that they just came as you were working easily. Oh, we, 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 pull, we go behind the curtain here. Um, that scene for Tanya, I'd say, was probably 10 pages and it was brought down to one paragraph. Hold on, um, hold on. Hold on. Oh, go you, you mean the scene where she's at the match? Yeah, yeah. That, that, that would have been probably 10 pages. And over the years, it was brought down to a paragraph. Um, also, Tanya's father had, had a 10,000 word uh, story for Tanya's father, who was in an original uh, version of the book. So... <laughs> All of that was brought down to a paragraph. So it took a while to get down to a paragraph, but I'm glad it runs well and it works well. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'm really, I'm really shocked. Uh, yeah. could you, could, sorry, I need to go back now because you're really wrong footed me. You, th- this is how you work. That in other words, that, that, you, that you would go home in the evening, say at five, you obviously get something to eat, and then you settle down and you would write pages and pages and pages do you know you're not going to use them? Do you know that you're drafting and that out of this will come something distilled? Is that how you work? I do know. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the way it worked with this one. Yeah. Did you know then? No, um, I didn't. And that was the problem. And it, and you learn as you're writing. And I know I obviously I've had two previous books, but you learn as you go on that that's what I should have been doing previously. And I know I've heard Wendy talk to you, Wendy Erskine talk to you, but she writes three times too much and comes down. Um with me, it took that level and I've learned it now. And for, for new work, I, I work the same. I write big and I'll bring it down. And it needs to have that. I, I'm not a good enough writer, I think, to like Colin Barrett to, to express myself brilliantly on the page like that. So I think as a writer, I need to now write as much as I can and then go back to it and enjoy the process of going back and enjoy the process of distilling one image like the father going across the pitch instead of writing, which I would have, the full football match. And I would have written the father coming out of the house and I would have written a story from the father's perspective and I would have written the fight and I would have written the aftermath of the fight and I would have written the mother coming in in her, in her pyjamas to stop the fight. So, but that's a good editor as well. So. Yeah. Yeah. My feeling is that no one, that no writer ever changes, that you have a method you work with and that you can't do anything to adapt it. But, uh, but I'm fascinated with that because I honestly, with that particular scene, I thought this must have come in a flash and been written in a second because it has that lovely feel of being organic and natural to the, natural to the moment and perfectly done. And uh, what pleasure it must be to be able to work like that. And now I'm completely <laughs> wrong. It, it was a pleasure to edit like that, but... Um... And that's what I've learned. I, I love editing. I love getting down to it. But that's, and again, and you'll know yourself, it's the, I mean, Sean in, in Lilliput, the editor that I had was just, it's amazing to work with an editor and be able to kind of get down to the essence of a scene like that and write the scene like that and have it feel effortless. But um, it took a while to get there, as would um, every paragraph in the book. This is this is Sean Farrell at Lilliput. Yes, yeah, yeah. Would Sean take, take that 10,000 words and bring it home and come back to you a week later saying, you know, I think you could bring this down to a paragraph. Or would that feeling come after much discussion with him? No, in, in, it's that, in that little piece itself, it would have been myself. I would have brought it down to a thousand words. But then Sean would have said too much. And then we would have brought it down from a thousand to maybe 300. And that's through the editor process but the big the, all the other characters that was all the rejections from the, from the different publishers saying there's too many characters there's too much here too much there but um what you get it when you get a good editor like that who can and you can trust who can distill something and he, he did that with a few scenes and a few kind of just get rid of that scene and bring this scene right down and i love that process i love learning about scenes from that process and seeing someone in work like that and then coming up with something that reads so easy as that and um, Kevin, I think I think for the rest of your life, um, people are going to come up to you on the street and say, either I'm princess or I know princess. I know she is. I know who you used or I know someone exactly like her or how did you get her or how did you make her? In the same way, I suppose, as people must have come up to John Millington Singh and said, where did Peggy, Peggy and Mike is so filled with contradictions, so filled with life. She's so needy in one way and so controlling and ready for the world in another. So I, so I need to ask you, <laughs> um, if, if someone were to say to you, I, I think that's me, princess, or where did you get her? Did you see her? Did you teach her? Did you invent her? 
that that's one of the, the the single biggest trail of of youth for me has been um having students like princess number one reading the book and seeing themselves on the page and number two believing a character princess exists on the page and then coming up to me and like my own students and saying we love princess and that's been so gratifying it's amazing because that's one of the main reasons i did it i've read enough books over the years in a class with my students that we don't have a princess um Princess, as I've said, is a dist distillation. As you know yourself, I've been 14 years teaching and I've seen, I've, as I said before, I've, I've seen four or five princesses every year pass through the school who might necessarily get on to be pharmacy or might not necessarily gone to Trinity, but they've all had a hope and a wish and a dream to overcome obstacles that weren't their fault they were putting their way. Um, so a princess is is all the students and none, if you, you, know, your, you know yourself, but um, just to make someone believable like that and have even my early readers, I had three girls read the princess chapters for me before she was published. Um, I always give them a shout out, uh, Tomalina, um, a Glory and uh, Queenie. Even when they were reading the A4 manuscript, um, they just, just they were blown away that they were reading someone like themselves on the page, which was was great. And then we had a, an actress do the audiobook in the same. She said this is the first time she's ever read a part in an Irish context that wasn't to do with being a refugee or wasn't to do with something that just didn't mean that you're just a character on the street on your own terms. Um, so that was Princess for me and uh, it, she worked and I'm glad she worked, but it took a long time to get there and a, a lot of work to get her to where I wanted to be. But to have the students now come back to me and say that they um, they love Princess was is is me doing. I'm just so, so um, grateful that that's happened. I, th I think anyone, male or female, irrespective of, of um, your race, who's ever thought that Staying in a library on a Thursday night until nine was something you look forward to. It was great. You, you, uh, people are going to start saying, "Yeah, I'm a bit like Princess." You know, I stay in the library until nine. But she's a complicated figure. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, it's not as though she's a really good girl and she just does everything well. But she, she, she's, she really knows how Ireland works. She knows, not, uh, you know, like like a lot of those kids who get all those A's, they have all that way. They have everything worked out, and she does. Except, of course, everything is against her. The hurdles. I mean, the hurdles she has to pass. But also what's fascinating is that she sees something in Angel that he almost doesn't see in himself, that the reader sees in him. But he uh, he's so confused and he's such a good guy, but he's a follower. He's someone who, who, who will easily go with the gang and she wants to isolate him, just get him back from that. And so that's a great drama, her, her power versus his, I suppose, insecurity becomes a great drama in the book. Yeah, and it just so happens that a student of mine again today has finished a book and he said to me, uh, I'm Angel. He said, I've I've been Angel all my life and I had a group like that and he's a Leaving Cert student and he, he sees himself in like that, like princess. And uh, that was important for me because I think the, the back to hyper-masculinity and especially for, for, for guys like Angel, they're surrounded by this idea of they're limited in what they see and what's presented to them as what's achievable in, in life. And it's not necessarily to do a race, it's to do a class as well in a lot of ways. And there's no, they don't see an actual way to go and a way to achieve things in life that, um, that doesn't present itself in English or American culture. And then we're talking drugs and we're talking rap music and drill music. And I think Princess just sees in him um, something more than just being with his mates and talking about stabbing lads and talking about rapping and all the misogynistic lyrics, that he has a sense that he wants to do something more um, with himself, but he doesn't know how, doesn't know how to step outside himself or step outside that that circle. And Princess is is wise enough or awake enough to see that if 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 he stays with her, if he do, talks with her, he can kind of form a new uh, a new road for himself, which he... I'm glad to see he, he takes. Yeah, I, I, we, we've been talking about this idea of masculinity, hyper-masculinity versus vulnerability. And we're talking about Princess as a very powerful, very, you know, figure, figure who really has certain things sussed. But you give her a great vulnerability physically. In other words, that in a room with some young men, she's really in danger, as Tanya is. I mean, it is, it is as though, even though these women are, I suppose, they're, 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 they're more confident but there's, there are moments when you think, I just, that, there's one a special moment in the book where you just think, please let her be okay. Please don't let this happen. And so, so, so you have a sense, not, not just of her controlling the world, but of certain moments where as a young woman, she's, she's really, really vulnerable. Yeah, and I know the moment you're talking about, and that intentionally, again, was 
we kept that vague, the, the kind of, you know, the chapter break, and we didn't address that until the very end because I wanted to play on the, the reader's kind of biases and prejudice and to kind of assume that the worst had happened. So you're kind of in some way surprised at the end. So that was like a, a technical thing. But again, you're talking about any, like I'm, I'm a father of a, a young eight-year-old girl. She'll be a teenager soon, too soon, unfortunately. But any girl in a, in a group of lads, and as we talked about with Dean and who are, who have been conditioned to believe certain ways of living and behaving around women, um, any any young girl in, in a situation like that, especially when they're alone, you have to worry for them, regardless of who the, the boys are. Um, I think the boys are, we said, conditioned by uh, what's acceptable and how to talk. But I think maybe that's changing. Um, and even from the 14 years that I'm, I'm teaching in the school, I've seen a change, not only in language used towards each other, but to women, but behaviour as well. So... Um, yeah, if this book was to be written in another six years, I think that sense of danger in amongst men hopefully will have shifted for teenagers and it won't be the same um, sense of trepidation if you're a girl on your own in a in a group of young lads like that. I think you must have a feeling writing this book and publishing it that you're at the cusp of something that, 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 you're, in a, that you're in a place of, I suppose, that has a special energy attached to it and, and that gives you both a sort of fa- power and responsibility. Um, as an artist, that 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 it, that that it, you must feel funny sometimes reading other novels that that are dealing as though life has, is not a struggle for the characters. Yeah. Um, number one, I wrote it not knowing it would be published. I think that's a good part way to write for for some right, yeah. because um, mm-hmm. yeah, you'd have so many questions then about Bob Riggin and uh, characters. So I wrote it not knowing it would be published, but I wrote it with a real. Um, drive to get it published because of the characters and I really wanted to see characters like Annie and Dean and Angel Princess be on the page and deal with those struggles like you say um, I read so much and I I just didn't see those struggles especially for teenagers and in modern Ireland being represented I know we have brilliant writers like Colin Barrett who who, who write teenagers like that Um, but just in a suburban setting in a multicultural setting in a working class setting in a contemporary setting and dealing with contemporary issues and contemporary struggles. It was it was a responsibility, 100% a responsibility, but you only had to hopefully deal with it in such a sense that it was true to the time and true to the characters. And um, once I was able to do that, um, it, 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 it works on the page. Like I've had, unfortunately, a mad experience where a few schools in the town are, are, are listening and reading the audiobook or reading the book and listening to the audiobook. So I had the weird experience of... Uh, listening to my own audiobook with my own transition year English class over the last six weeks. Um, well, that's when, this is that, this, that's when this you know, one. <laughs> this book, so that's when you, you are being tested. Every single sentence in front of a group of 16 and 17 year olds um, was they listened to it. And now at the end, again, it's one of the greatest reading experiences of my life as a writer. Uh, on the last word, the class literally broke into applause and clapped, which was incredible. But you have, an, you have a responsibility to that generation and those readers to be correct about how they are and uh, what they face in life and what they see and what they have to deal with. So that was uh, the book being tested to the max in a, in a situation like that. But I felt that responsibility. And especially when you're listening to people read out every line and you're sitting there with a group of 28, 16, 17 year olds, if you're wrong on anything and if you, you make, make a misstep on anything, they were going to let you know and... Uh, Lucky enough, I got away unscathed. That's all right. That, that really must have been an extraordinary experience. Yes, it was. It, it was amazing because you live. I never thought it would be number one read in the classroom. So the other schools in the town were told me they were going to read it. So my principal said, "Well, you're the teacher in the school, so we might as well do it here too." Luckily enough, I wasn't. We had an audio book, and you could hear the laughter from lines and a lot of the language was uh, amazing. I thought I'd say it was weird for the kids, but to have the explosion of like totally wasn't expecting it, the kids to clap at the end. Um, I think they obviously, they were, they were filled with the sense of hope that I uh, hope was there at the end of the book. So that was amazing and a mental experience, but uh, also very gratifying. Now.